Hello. Uh, welcome to another one of our press conferences. This is, this is a press conference on um, glaciers and ice caps contributions to sea level rise. And we have four people on the panel today. Sebastian Marnold is a research scientist at the Los Alamos National R Laboratory in the US. Uh, and we have three representatives of the ice to sea program. I'm sure they'll tell you more about uh, that initiative. Um, I will start from, from the back end. David Vaughan is the leader of the ice to sea program and he's also a professor. <laughs> he's also a professor at the British Antarctic Survey. John von of Hagen is a professor at the University of Oslo in Norway, and Philippe Wibrecht is a professor at the Brussels University in Belgium. Thank you. Go for it. Okay. Thank you. What's up? Can you hear me? Sure. Okay. Uh, I will talk briefly about a study we did, uh, me and my colleagues which are listed here on the first screen, about imbalance and accelerating melting from uh, glaciers uh, worldwide. Uh, we digged into observed data from 144 uh, glaciers uh, worldwide to see how has have these glaciers actually changed their, their mass, annual mass balance within the last uh, four decades and with focus on the last decade and changes in climate. So, yeah. And to highlight the conclusions, these are listed here in, in five uh, bullets. So when we dig into all the observations, we see that the mass balance of glaciers and ice caps has actually been decreasing, meaning that glaciers have lost more and more mass within the last four decades. We see that glaciers are what we call out of balance according to the present climate, meaning that, so to say, that they're actually too big according to what they should if they are able to adjust to the, to the present climate. I'll talk a little bit about that later. We can see that the glaciers, based on the present climate, is committed to lose around 30% of the area and 38% of their volume, meaning that if we instantaneously shut off global warming, they will still shrink, they will still become smaller in area and volume, and then they will adjust uh, to the climate. And if things will change according to a warmer climate within the next decades or centuries. We see that, at least if you go towards 2040, we see that these glaciers and ice caps will lose around half of their uh, volume. I forgot to say that <coughs> according to the, to the present state and based on what we have seen for the last 10 years, we can see that these glaciers are committed to lose around 230 uh, millimeters according to or related to the global sea level rise. And this is only from all these small glaciers located outside the two big ice sheets, the Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctic ice sheet. So this is the main points of our latest uh, research study. And to follow that up, I have some uh, slides here uh, just to, yeah, state the conclusions. We know worldwide that glaciers has shrinked in area and volume, and here we have two examples, one from northern Alaska and one from eastern, uh, southeastern Greenland. And it's obvious that the ice is actually retreating and, and melting and moving further up in the terrain. <coughs> the study, as I said, are based on 144 observations worldwide, divided into 16 uh, regions. We are following here the IPCC report or the IPCC work according to the AR5 report and how they divide the globe into regions. Um, we divide it into what we call high mass regions and small or low mass regions according to the glacier volume in each. Uh, and we did based on that different um, trend lines, which is 
on the next slide. But before we go to the next one, I just want to emphasize that <coughs> that if you take into account all the blue boxes, all the high mass regions, it actually contains 90, 70 percent of the total ice uh, on the globe. So the green boxes only contain, if you sum up all the ice volume, uh, around 3 percent. Okay, yeah. <coughs> the trend in the glacier mass balance has been going towards more negative values within the last uh, four decades, uh, not surprisingly. Um, yeah, and you can see no matter what method we used, one and two, uh, we actually see the same overall pattern. The glaciers are losing more and more mass and more and more uh, volume. Uh, and it actually fits pretty much or pretty well uh, to earlier uh, uh, publications. The study here, as I said, had 144 or included 144 glaciers, which is more than earlier studies. Uh, so both in the number of glaciers but also in the distribution of glaciers worldwide, this study has much more detail compared to what we have seen uh, earlier. And if we dig into, uh, as I said, the committed area laws, we can see that on global scale, the glaciers is... Okay, I have to say that 1.0 is where the glaciers actually are in balance with the present climate. But due to that climate uh, wrecks or the changes in climate occur faster than the changes in the ice, we can see that, that around 30%, if you take 1 minus 0 0.7, that gives you 0 0.3, that's 30%. So, okay, one minute. Okay, so we see that globally the glaciers will commit 30% of their area, meaning that within the next decades up to centuries, they will actually lose 30% of, of their area, and as I said, 38% of their volume, and that will contribute to the global sea level rise, rise by 228. But if you just here uh, finally dig into the regional uh, distribution, you can see that some of the areas, some of the regions are actually uh, more out of balance uh, so to say, compared to compared to Eritz, and especially Central Europe and Svalbard and Greenland are those regions which actually will contribute more to global sea level rise compared to uh, other regions uh, on the globe. But in Eritz, uh, the glaciers, the glacier area will shrink by 30 percent. And if we do a, a trend line going towards 2040, we can see that that the glaciers will actually commit around 50% of their volume to global sea level rise. So that's even more compared to what we have seen so far due to the changes in present climate. Uh, and that's around 50% of the total volume in all these small glaciers uh, we see. So, thank you. Yeah, I think they mm. want to continue the direction. <coughs> Which one are you? Oh, it's, uh, it's on the one. Okay. Can you push the one? What does that mean? Uh, in, in that box here. This box? No, it's at the side here. One? Yeah. You pressed it. Yeah. I have pressed it. It was two, wasn't it? No, it's one. All right, um, um, I'll continue with, uh, with the ice sheets. Uh, they're separate from glaciers, they're big features. And uh, I'll be talking about uh, projections we made of the response of the Greenland ice sheet uh, to uh, future sea level change. And this is work that uh, has been performed as part of the uh, uh, ice to sea project. And uh, the three of us, we're all, all involved in uh, this uh, uh, European project. So this uh, Greenland ice sheet, it's uh, of large interest. Um, it, it contains something like seven meters of sea level rise. And uh, it's very sensitive to climate change. Um, already today, there is a lot of uh, melting on its surface. And uh, models indicate that for a warming of only three degrees, 
we are committed to lose this ice sheet, but on a very long term. This will take thousands of years. But it's, of course, important to, uh, to find out how fast this can go on the uh, centennial time scale, how fast the ice sheet can melt on a time scale of 100 to 200 years. And that's what we've been trying to do uh, with uh, an improved set of models. And this is also uh, input uh, to the uh, IPCC report. So uh, we're using uh, new generations of uh, ice sheet models and improved techniques. And we base on ourselves on improved uh, observational data. And at on one side, uh, we have uh, improved ice sheet models, high resolution. And important is that these ice sheet models, they are able to deal with uh, what's called fast ice dynamics. There's been a lot of discussion about fast ice, dyna ice dynamics, and these models, this new generation of models can in fact deal with those. And on the other hand, we prescribe changes in the climate, so which are driving changes in the ice sheet uh, from uh, high resolution climate models, regional climate, climate models that are embedded in uh, global general circulation models and are uh, come up with uh, climate changes over the ice sheets to a great detail. Uh, and the projections I will show here go up to the year uh, 2200. So uh, they're covering the next uh, one to two uh, centuries. So up front, uh, one, uh, one set of uh, results. So this is uh, the typical result we find when we consider a medium scenario. This is a medium climate scenario. This is the A1B scenario defined uh, for IPCC. Uh, and what we see here is that for several combinations of uh, regional climate models and uh, global uh, uh, general circulation models, uh, we get something like five centimeters of uh, sea level rise from the Greenland ice sheet for this scenario by the end of this century and <coughs> something like 15 centimeters uh, by the end of the uh, uh, second uh, uh, century of this millennium, by 2200. What's important in, this, in these models is that most of this change in ice volume and most of this sea level rise is due to what happens at the surface on the ice sheets. It's due to changes in snowfall and changes in surface melting. So that's what really what is driving uh, uh, most of the volume change of these ice sheets. So this is a climatic component. Uh, depends on, on how the climate changes over the ice sheet and how this translates into uh, more melting and or uh, different patterns of accumulation. At the, at the same time, <coughs> part of this uh, uh, volume change due to mass balance changes uh, is offset by less discharge into the ocean. And that's what you see in the, in the lower part. It's only a few centimeters. And that is because the glaciers around Greenland, they tend to thin in these scenarios. And when they become thinner, there is less ice that can be discharged into the ocean. Uh, but it's a, it's a minor effect when you compare it with the uh, uh, direct effect of the, of the surface climate. This is only for one scenario, what you see here, just one scenario. So it's interesting to see how these results, how they compare with methods that we used for the previous IPCC report. In the previous IPCC report, we, we used uh, GCMs, not regional climate models, but GCMs, and some kind of parameterization for the surface mass balance. That's what you see here as GCM PDD. That's uh, the stippled lines here. And here we compare them for the same scenario with the new results we have now, with the regional climate models. And as you can see, they are in fact quite similar. So uh, uh, we, we, we have much more detail, we have Im improved models, but if we go back to the old uh, uh, way, we, we, we get <coughs> similar numbers. And that's a very useful finding, because this can enable us to generalize these findings from these regional climate models to the full set of new IPCC scenarios. And that's what we've done here. So then this puts in a, in a position to generalize these uh, uh, projections to the full range of uncertainty in climate models and in uh, climate scenarios. And these are the new IPCC fifth assessment report uh, models and the new scenarios that have been defined for that. 
And if you look here at the response for this century, uh, we should not take into account the blue line. The blue line is an outlier. This is a model that is uh, behaving a bit strange, and, and uh, we still have to find out what's actually going on. But if you don't take this one into account, for the, the range of the scenarios, uh, a low scenario, a mid scenario, and a high scenario, we, we find sea level changes uh, between something like 0 0.3 centimeter, a very small number, and 12 centimeters by the end of this century. This is due to changes in the, in the surface mass balance. And most of this uh, range here is, in fact, due to the uncertainty in the climate model, not so much the uncertainty in the scenario. It's the climate model that does this. So this is the one side. This is the, uh, what we find uh, with these new models of the range of sea level change from Greenland. Now, there's one other aspect. There's one other aspect in the previous IPCC report what was not taken into account were the potential effect of changes in ice discharge, the so-called ice dynamic changes, because there were no good observations and the models were not good enough to really quantify that. And also in this respect, I think uh, we have made quite some progress by better constraining and better quantifying uh, the potential uh, uh, effect of such changes. And with Greenland there are two. One of them is the effect of what's called meltwater lubrication. That's meltwater from the surface which uh, percolates through the ice and lubricates uh, uh, the bottom of the ice and makes the ice flow faster. That's what we have investigated here. Uh, and, we see, and, now, and we find this to be a very minor effect. We only find some millimeters from this effect. Uh, and this was uh, th th this is a, this is a, a, a new result. We, we are better. We are able to better quantify this, and we did this because we have uh, better observations now. And the better observations are shown shown here. These are uh, uh, speed up rates. These are uh, linked to uh, runoff at the surface. So how much the glaciers would speed up? Something like 30, 40 percent. These are all the observations uh, that we know of uh, since the last four to five years. And it's these relations which went, went into, these, uh, into these models and gave this uh, few millimeters only uh, because of uh, basal lubrication. And then there's a second one, and that uh, will, be, will be my last slide. Um, that has uh, gotten a lot of attention. That is, some of the glaciers in Greenland, they reach the ocean. And at the ocean, they come in contact with warmer ocean water and they melt. And some of these outlet glaciers are retreating and they're sensitive. So if the ocean warms further, they may retreat further. And this is quantified by uh, running very uh, uh, highly detailed, oh, uh, quantified by running highly detailed flow line models and use this as in input in, 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 the, in the whole ice sheet three-dimensional models. So this generates retreat scenarios in some of these outlet glaciers, and a the model then can generalize this over whole, all of the ice sheet. If you do this for all of Greenland, we find something like one centimeter of sea level rise extra because of oceanic erosion of these outlet glaciers, and something like five or six centimeters maximally uh, by uh, 2200. So to, uh, to sum up the main points of uh, this new set uh, of projections, uh, we find that most of the changes in the Greenland ice sheet are in fact uh, driven by change in the surface mass balance. So it's the climate that, that's important, the surface climate that's important here. We have a total range of something between 1 and 14 centimeters. And this is accidentally almost the same range than the previous IPCC report. So we confirm the previous projections, uh, albeit we have uh, much improved uh, models and much improved uh, observations of the last few years. And an important finding is that uh, because of better modeling and more observations, we can better constrain this potential contribution from changes in the ice dynamic discharge. And this was a factor which was omitted in the last IPCC report because it could not be uh, quantified. And we have uh, made some progress there. Okay, so I'm next. I guess we have to switch back to the other. Okay, I will not talk about scenarios or models, but uh, more what we observe today. And my, I have two points. 
mainly, and that is don't forget the glaciers and ice caps surrounding the ice sheets all around in the Arctic. And I will just give you a couple of examples on how they contribute to sea level and also about this so-called dynamic instability. Uh, if you look at uh, the glaciers and ice caps surrounding the Arctic, they are, as you see from this image, they are surrounding the green ice sheet, but you find them all over in the Arctic. And altogether, they <coughs> have more than 50% of all the glaciers in the world outside the ice sheets are found in the Arctic. And if you look at the numbers, the sum is about 400,000 square kilometers. So the Greenland ice sheet itself is four times larger than the sum of all the glaciers and ice caps. But still, if we look at the contribution to sea level change, it's on a similar range. And that is the key point here. If you look at these time periods, ten, from 1961 to 1990, you see the total volume, annual volume loss from Greenland and from the glaciers and ice caps. At that time, the glaciers and ice caps lost more mass than Greenland. Later, you see the accelerating trend with a very high volume loss over the last five years, 2006 to 2010, wh where Greenland is in the order of 200 gigatons per year. The number doesn't tell you much, but still, you see that the glaciers and ice caps, even if they are only 25% in area, they still contribute about the same range of sea to sea level. So that is the main point, that the glaciers and ice caps, because they are more sensitive to climate changes, they are all at lower elevation, but, and they contribute almost the same volume to sea level as the green and ice sheet. But there are huge regional variations in the impact. I will not go into that. Uh, so just if you look at the global picture, this two uh, graphs shows you very nicely the relative contribution to sea level rise that we had in the last IPCC report, 2007, and uh, th to the right, the current contribution, the relative contribution to sea level rise, and we see that still the glaciers and ice caps contribute 40 to 50 percent of the total volume to sea level at the moment. I'm not talking about scenarios, so in the long run, this will probably change because you have less volume in the smaller, but currently, they are extremely important for the global uh, assessment. So that's, that's one point. The second point is that these Arctic glaciers and ice caps, they behave very similar to the ice sheets. And some of the ice caps, we are looking at one ice cap here in the Svalbard archipelago, which is, uh, as you see here, north. Uh, east of, of Greenland, and we have one ice cap that we have studied over the last 10 years with uh, 8,000 square kilometers, so it's a very large ice cap, one of the biggest outside the ice sheets, and they drain in a similar way as the ice sheets. Y the mass is draining in fast-flowing ice streams, and we have studied one ice stream here, one outlet ice stream, very similar to ice streams that you see from the ice sheets, and they behave very similar. But now we have got the possibility to, to monitor the, tr the velocity of it continuously. So over the last three years, we have a continuous GPS measurements on these fast-flowing ice stream, showing the change in the velocities over seasons and over years. And that gives us some very, very interesting and surprising results. This is the velocity in one drainage basin over four years from 2008. And what you see is the speed up during the summer. Phil mentioned that you have lubricate the bottom because you have summer melt. So there is a clear seasonal speed up, but there is also an annual speed up here. So what we see here that over the last four years, this ice stream is in general moving two to three times faster than it did only four years ago. So it's a very dynamic and stable system. That was the main point. And the calving loss of these ice caps has about 30-40% of the total mass loss. We have melting on the surface, but we have calving in addition. So just to summarize, the Arctic glaciers and ice caps lose mass as fast as Greenland. 
but there are huge regional variability in the Arctic. And the ice caps are very dynamic and stable. So we need to follow the dynamics also of the smaller ice caps. And not only, you have always heard a lot about the fast flowing ice streams from the ice sheet, but this seems to also to be the case from the ice caps. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. I have several uh, roles to take here. <coughs> One is to um, describe a little bit about the Ice to Sea program, um, but I'm also going to describe the results of a paper that's come out of Ice to Sea, but also my group at British Antarctic Survey, um, which will be appearing in Nature tomorrow and is subject to their embargo until um, 1800 UK time tonight. So, first of all, I'd just like to remind us why we really think it's important to study the contribution of ice sheets and glaciers to sea level rise. Um, in Europe, especially, we have a lot of coastal assets that are subject to periodic flooding uh, as sea level is uh, high during storm surge events. This is uh, close to my heart. This is London, but I could be talking about Rotterdam or Liverpool or Hamburg or uh, Copenhagen, these are all areas that are subject to flooding. A lot of the time we talk about sea level rise as if it's a matter that people are being chased up the beach, chased inland, and it's really not the case. What we're really talking about is that over the future, sea level has risen slowly, and that affects the frequency with which our coastal cities, especially, are subject to these storm surges. That's a, that's a nice picture that shows that in London we've been very responsive in the past to how sea level has, uh, how storm surges have occurred. And each time we've seen a large storm surge that's either flooded London or threatened to flood London, we've raised the, raised the defences. As sea level rises in future, we almost certainly have to raise the defences and the big defences that we have, the Thames barrier, will no longer be adequate um, by the end of the century. The reason for that is tied up in this graph which shows the flood return frequency across the bottom of the axis versus the flood height. Essentially, the London is protected at the moment against the all but the one in a thousand year storm surge, but the difference between a one in a thousand year storm surge and one in a hundred years is only half a metre and one in 10 years is only one metre. So if we raise sea level by 50 centimetres, we change the frequency of flooding from once in a 1,000 years to once in a 100 years, if we don't improve the protection. If we raise it by another 50 centimetres, so one metre in total, then that protection level goes down to one in 10 years. So the big difference, there is a huge difference in how we uh, proceed with changing our storm defences, improving our coastal defences, between 50 centimetres and a metre of sea level rise. So the kind of numbers that Sebastian was talking about, 20 centimetres by 2100, in, in itself it doesn't sound like a big number, but it is in terms of how we respond to it. So that's a, a point that I think is, is not well understood in the general uh, by the general public and even some policy makers. So what are we publishing tomorrow? We're publishing a paper about the Antarctic ice sheet and how its ice shelves, which are the floating part of the ice, uh, ice sheet around the periphery of the continent are changing. This is purely observational. In the past we've published this map, which is how the grounded ice sheet, which is resting on rock, is changing. And we can see areas where there is increasing snowfall, the blue areas, for instance, which are increasing the ice thickness. But we can also see those quite dramatic red areas where the ice is thinning and losing mass back into the ocean. So that's where we are at the moment. What we will be publishing um, is a map of the thickness changes on the floating ice shelves. I should go back. It, the grey areas around the edge, let me try and point, um, for instance, this big area here and these areas through here are the ice shelves which are floating. 
Um, they don't contribute to sea level in themselves because they're already floating and displacing their mass of seawater, but as they change, they may affect the inland ice sheet. And I'll show you an example of that later. This is actually a diagram that really is in the, uh, in the paper, but just simply proves that we can do what we say we're going to do. So I'm going to skip over that. That's an ice shell floating in water. Um, the simplest diagram I could draw. Measuring ice shelf thickness changes is actually much harder than measuring grounded ice sheet changes, in part because the ice is floating. And if we change the thickness of, the, of that ice shelf by, let's say, 10 metres, then the surface elevation change will only be about 2 metres, possibly less than 2 metres. So if we're measuring um, the elevation of this surface by a satellite, which is exactly what we do, then actually the changes in that surface might be quite small compared to the overall changes in the ice shelf. The other complicating factor is that you can change that surface elevation without actually changing the mass of the ice shelf by removing air from the ice shelf, making it denser. And that's a process that could be driven by climate change. In actual fact, that's a process that we do see. So this is the, the summary diagram, and really we have to focus on these areas, these areas, and then these red areas uh, around West Antarctica, and a few small areas in East Antarctica where the ice shelves themselves are thickening. Uh, thinning. What we've actually done here is remove the first of those processes that I described to you, which was the, the removal of air from the ice sheet. And I'm just showing you here where the ice shelves are melting through the basal, the uh, melt off the bottom of the ice shelves, i.e. the ocean-driven melt. What we can see is, if you remember back to that grounded ice sheet ice losses, the area through this part of Antarctica is the area where both the ice shelves and the ice sheet is losing mass. We connect those two uh, effects and we can determine now that it is the melt driven by the ocean which is the primary cause of loss from the larger parts of West Antarctica and East Antarctica. The Antarctic Peninsula is slightly different. There we also see thinning ice shelves, but those are largely driven by that first process of air loss, and they're driven by an atmospheric warming, which we've measured. So it's a slightly patchy um, uh, picture that we see, but the larger part of East and West Antarctica, which we are most concerned about future sea level rise, is being driven by ocean change. Um, that's a blow up of that of the West Antarctic ice sheet and we can really see that all of the ice shelves, let me find my cursor, Pine Island Glacier, Thwaites Glacier and the other glaciers through the Amundsen Sea, the ice shelves themselves are thinning and this is having an effect on the grounded ice behind it. Essentially as the ice shelves thin they allow the glaciers to move faster towards the ocean and to drain the continent of ice more rapidly. In a few areas, even quite close, where the ice isn't subject to uh, that ocean melting, the ice shelves, the grounded ice sheet is not seeing the same change. So this really is quite a sensitive test of what cause, uh, causes the ice sheet to thicken it, thinning. The Antarctic Peninsula, slightly different effect is going on there. We can see up in this panel how the ice shelves are thinning, but if we remove that surface effect and look at the basal melting, it's actually quite a small signal. So here on the Antarctic Peninsula, Peninsula, it's atmospheric warming that's doing the damage. Around the rest of Antarctica, it's ocean warming that's doing the damage. So what do we see? In summary, we see that all the, we've measured all the other shelves around Antarctica, um, 54 separate ice shelves, 20 of them are being melted by the ocean on which they float and a change in the circulation of the ocean on which they float. Each of those 20 glaciers where they're being affected by ocean melting, the glaciers are speeding up and the inland ice sheet is consequently losing ice. In East and West Antarctica, the ice, sheet thinning, ice shelf thinning 
is a result of the ocean melting, but on the Antarctic Peninsula it is atmospheric warming that's getting the ice shelves. Um, and eventually some of those ice shelves have collapsed, Larsen A, Larsen B, which we've seen in the past. But the, I think the, the take-home message from this paper is that the majority of ice loss from Antarctica currently is a result of ocean change. How do we interpret this? And this is where we get into some rather interesting stuff. We know that warm water is drawn into the coastal seas underneath these ice shelves by winds around Antarctica. It's the wind stress that draws the ocean water in. We know that the atmospheric warming on the Antarctic Peninsula is also largely caused by changes in wind patterns. So although two different processes have been involved, actually we come back to the same thing which is that changes in winds are actually very, very key to how the Antarctic ice sheet will respond in future. I draw a distinction between the Antarctic and Greenland. Greenland is seeing temperature changes that are uh, probably su sufficient to cause melt rate changes, but that's a different area. Um, and so we're really seeing a sensitivity to wind and ocean change. If we need to predict the future of Antarctica, with rather high precision, because as you remember, the difference between uh, 10 to 20 centimetres actually has an effect on how our cities see storm surges, then we need to really understand that process. Ice to Sea is a big programme, 24 partners around Europe, some of them are represented here. We're working in collaboration with our other colleagues further afield to try and predict the future of contribution of sea level rise. You will hear more about ice to sea in the near future. We have more papers coming out that follow up this story. So there will be stuff coming even in the next few weeks. Thank you very much. Thank you for the excellent presentations. Are there any questions to our speakers? Please say your name and affiliation when asking. Sorry, and wait for the microphone. <laughs> Hi, I'm Verity. I work for the Carbon Brief. Um, I was just wondering, what causes the wind changes that you see around Antarctica? Mm. Um, we can see it as part of overall climate change, but I think we hesitate at this moment to say that this has a direct... We can, we can attribute this to uh, anthropogenic causes. Could be. It's not uh, incompatible with what we know about anthropogenic changes, but we are actually standing away from that attribution at the moment. We don't have all the links and the change sorted. Um, but if we did attribute it to it, it would be not only greenhouse gases but also ozone that are implicated in this. The Antarctic Peninsula warming certainly uh, seems to have a strong ozone signal in as well as uh, greenhouse gas. But I think, you know, certainly from the paper that I'm talking about, we stand away from that attribution at the moment. What we can say is the oceans and the winds are really clearly very important. Any more questions? Um, hi, Jonathan Amos from the BBC. I wonder if you could make some general statements about time scales. I mean, it's one thing to know that sea level might rise by 50 centimetres or uh, 100 centimetres, but if I'm a planner and I need to spend several billion uh, protecting London or yeah. Copenhagen or wherever, it's almost more important to me to know how long a time I've got in which to spend that money because it's an awful lot of money. So um, I wonder if you could just make some general statements about timescales. You just want to know how, how fast sea level yeah. can rise. Well, I mean, this, uh, this is part of the projections that also IPCC is involved with. Um, I think, well, at this time, the consensus seems to be that uh, it's going to be, well, I can't, I, I can't tell the final numbers, but it's unlikely, very unlikely, to be more than one meter by the end of the century. Uh, let's say it this way. But this, this would have a very low probability. It's, it's very interesting. When you talk to people um, who are involved with sea defense, what question they really want to ask you. Um, I, for instance, have talked to the Environment Agency who are responsible for protecting London, and there the consequence of a flood to London would be so catastrophic, we have to protect at a very high level. So we have to be very confident that we're protecting to that one in a thousand year, perhaps one in five hundred year level. 
And therefore, you're really looking at the upper range of sea level projections and wanting to know what those are. Elsewhere around Europe and, you know, again in the UK, there are areas of far farmland which are uh, threatened by flooding. There, it would be very hard to get landowners themselves to bear the cost of protecting against a perhaps one in 20 chance of sea level rise. There they would like to know what the mid-range estimate is, what the likely sea level rise is, because that's really what, you know, if they're using their own money to protect the, uh, their assets, then that's probably all they want to uh, spend. So I think the, the, the job for scientists is to actually provide a very coherent picture of what the mid-range estimates are and also what the high-range estimates are. And I, I think by the time we get down to less than 1 in 20, so you know, the 95% upper level, then we're you know, it's starting to get very uncertain. But I wouldn't disagree with what Philippe says, that by the time we get to anything over a metre of sea level rise by 2100, it's looking pretty unlikely. However, the consequences of even a metre are very significant, so we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't imagine that those are trivial. Any other questions? Yeah, maybe I comment a little bit more okay. on that, Sorry. because I think it's important that even 50 centimetres is, is significant rise, because as David mentioned, it comes on, it's, we're talking about storm surges, and the sea level comes on top of that. So of course you may have flooding, even with, if the sea level was stable, but then you more or less uh, know the level. Now we rise the level a little bit, so uh, that is uh, the point that is quite often difficult to understand for, for people when you talk about storm surges of one meter, which can happen everywhere, even if the sea level is stable. But when you get the sea level a little bit higher, you may get the storm surges also higher, so that, that's uh, important to stress that. Hello. Warsaw Crook, uh, freelance science writer. Um, in a recent paper by some of your colleagues, George and Michiel Br van der Broeke was also involved, uh, about sea level, global sea level rise, they, um, they suggest that um, for the last 50 years, 80% was thermal expansion and only 20% was from the ice caps. Um, is that is that correct? Is it, because in in your information sheet that I was reading, the sea ice to to uh, information sheet, there were higher numbers for the for the glaciers and the ice caps compared to thermal expansion. So I wondered how you look at this paper. And well, it all depends on which period you're looking at. Huh? If you look at uh, the last ten years, then uh, it's about one third, one third, one third, one third glaciers and ice caps. Uh, one third ice sheets and one third thermal expansion. If you look over a longer period, thermal expansion is more important. Although I don't seem to remember, it's 80%. Uh, it's probably a bit less than that. But uh, for, for the 20th century, the thermal expansion is the dominant one. Uh, the, the land ice melting is, uh, is smaller than the thermal expansion. That's right. So, uh, but, uh, but what we do see over the last few decades is that the contribution from land ice is increasingly becoming more important. And you expect that to continue more? Well, it has to, if, if, if the warming uh, goes on, this is uh, what everybody expects. There's such a large reservoir of uh, land ice to be melted uh, on the long term. So it, it should be the do uh, dominant term in the future. Yeah, that's uh, really what, what uh, on physical grounds, what one would expect. Yeah. In, in some respects, um, Philip is right. The, the IPCC, the last IPCC report, 2007, identified the ice sheets as the, as the major uncertainty. And there, in, in some sense, it was because there is a potentially very large contribution, but also there was a great uh, deal of unknown uh, processes going on there that we really didn't have a handle on. At present, thermal expansion of the oceans is... is in large part relatively predictable, given the right climate projections. Um, and glaciers around the world are actually very um, um, predictable using these statistical methods because there are so many 
hundreds of thousands of those glasses, they are appropriate to statistical methods. The problem we have with ice sheets is there are only two of them. And that means that there is no statistical approach that works. We need to understand each system and what's driving it to change in order to be able to make projections. And, and we also don't have very good records of how they've changed in the past. Because as they advance, they obliterate everything surrounding them. So we have records of how they've retreated since the last glacial maximum. But that's the only record that we have against which we can really test our models. And then very short observational records. So in terms of contribution, thermal expansion will continue, certainly for the next few decades, to probably be the dominant um, contribution. But in terms of the um, uncertainty out over several decades towards a century, then the ice sheets become that much more important, largely because of the uncertainty. Could I ask a second question? Um, one of the things that um, interests me is that um, we know there is decadal fluctuations in the system, natural variability, things like that. We know that Greenland was quite warm in the, uh, in the 1930s, 40s. And we have the problem, of course, that we have only satellite measurements since the 1980. Since 1980, um, can you already take that into account in the into the, in, in, the, in the models, for example? That because now we have the, we have had this 30-year period where we see uh, well warming, but could it be that in Greenland, for example, you get cooling for the next 20, 30 years, and that it's going much slower than we expect now? Uh, yeah, that's a, it's a difficult question, of course, uh, but I, I agree. I mean, the, this observational period is rather short. And it's, for the ice sheets, in fact, it's too short to really confidently distinguish between decadal variation and a trend. Although I think we should probably make a distinction between Antarctica and Greenland here. If you look at Greenland over the last 20 years, uh, the, the data seem to, uh, to indicate more and more that it is consistently losing mass. And that is well, it's undoubtedly linked to warming over Greenland. And this warming over Greenland starts to become, it becomes possible to statistically link this to global warming, let's say it this way, uh, more and more. So tentatively for Greenland, one might come to the stage when one can't say that uh, what we see now is a manifestation of, of a global warming. Uh, and this statement can be made with much more confidence for Greenland than it can be made for Antarctica. Um, models do not predict over Greenland a cooling. I have not seen a single model prediction that predicts a cooling over Greenland during this century. On the contrary, uh, there is something playing which is the, called the uh, polar amplification. The warming in the Arctic region is increasing more or is higher than the global average. And that's a very robust feature of uh, all climate models. So there's not, not a single projection we have ever made that shows that uh, Greenland would be growing during this century. It's always losing mass. Uh... I have a comment to add here. Uh, we actually digged into temperature data from 10 climate stations in Greenland around the coast. Uh, for the last 50 years, where we have very good data. And as Philip said, we can see that the temperature has been increasing uh, on annual scale. But we can also see that within the last decade, uh, if you take the time series and take the upper 10% and the lower 10% of the samples, we can actually see that the climate has become more extreme if you define the upper 10% as being as extreme values. And this has significant, a significant warmer climate within the last 10 years compared to the earlier uh, five decades. Back to yeah, only back to 1960. And if you're interested, I have figures I can show you. But this is where we actually have very good observed mid data from around the coast of Greenland. But, but if you look at the entire Arctic, there are obviously regional differences in the climate that's observed. And that's why I mentioned <coughs> that uh, the, if you look at the glaciers around <coughs> in the Arctic, you see the same accelerating melt on the, the in the Canadian Arctic as you see in Greenland, but not in the Russian Arctic, for instance, where you don't see the same warming as you see in Greenland. So there are obviously regional differences in the, in the climate development, of course. 
I just want to ask that, answer that briefly as well. Uh, you are absolutely right that in this short observational period that we have from the satellites, we've seen more fluctuation in the light ice loss from Greenland than we expected. We saw it start in the southeast and slowly over the last few years it's moved round into the, through the southwest and up into the, to the northwest. And that is a surprise. But we can interpret that in, in as a, a higher level of sensitivity in the ice sheet to even relatively small uh, changes in atmospheric and ocean temperature. And that sensitivity, if, if we're projecting over the next century that both of those you know, temperatures will warm, then actually what we're seeing is a more sensitive system than we would have predicted 10 years ago. So I think that it's, yes, there is a higher level of natural variability in the system than we thought there was going to be. But that actually shows that it's a more sensitive system than we thought it was a few years ago. Thank you. I'm afraid we have run out of time for questions, but you are welcome to approach any of the four speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. The next press conference is at 12 on soils and greenhouse gas emissions. <coughs>